Awesome. And my slides are there as well. So, um, hi everyone. Um, you might know me from the mic before. <laughs> uh, my name is Florian, I work for Arista. Um, and the reason I'm giving this talk is we see way more interest nowadays in 400 gig, but particularly around the metro and long haul connections, um, where 100 gig was a bit, well, let's call it behind. Um, but just to set the stage a bit, um, we have a lot of optics right now. We have a lot of variant optic types. Um, today we're just focusing on that very, very small area on the top right. So talking about ZR and ZR+. Um, and I just want to bore you with some specifications. What is ZR Plus actually about? Um, so we're talking about a channel range in the uh, 191 to 196 terahertz grid. Um, for our our solution, I'm gonna show you on the next slide what we did the real test, real world testing with. Um, it's pretty much the recommended space from the well what is it 900 uh sorry 193 to 195 tera grid uh, terahertz um uh, range zr can do a channel spacing of 100 gigahertz or uh, 75 gigahertz and now the interesting part comes the current optics are below um, 10 dbm launch power this is usually because of power constraints for ZR, you also have a minimum of uh, minimum OSNR, which is kind of sensible then to the distance as well as the uh, chromatic dispersion. For the fiber, we're usually talking single mode only, obviously, so it's known as G65 um, 652D. Um, why are we talking particularly around this single mode fiber? Because it has pretty good specifications around the uh, maximum attenuation and the chromatic dispersion as well, which is around 17 picoseconds per nanometer. Um, the ideal range for ZR in this case would be below um, 0 0.25 dBm, uh, dB of attenuation per kilometer. In the real world, you will see, and I'm going to show this later on as well, that this amount is could could be way higher, but briefly, if you talk about optical networking, um, there are certain terms are coming up, which is like chromatic dispersion, as I mentioned uh, mentioned it before. What is it actually? So chromatic dispersion is a phenomenon where shorter wavelengths need more time to travel on the same fiber, which means that your signal might start as it shows here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, you send the signal at the same time, but the different wavelengths are actually arriving in a different pattern over time, which makes it um, way more difficult to um, establish a signal. Also, you have the optical uh, signal-to-noise ratio. So you usually always have some noise on... Um, on your fiber, that usually comes because of the attenuation of the length and what so on. So you need to have a certain amount of a ratio between your actual signal and the noise, because otherwise you can't differentiate actually what's noise and what's um, what's the signal. So there is a direct relationship between OSNR and the bit error rate on the link. The first test we did with ZR was with a customer in Turkey. Um, we were running two links, one around 40 kilometers, a bit less, and the second point-to-point -point link around 80 kilometers. Um, those tests I'm sharing with you were done on actual fiber. This is a bit more of a representation, to be honest. Um, but the tests were not in a lab. They were out there in the wild, and you can also see why I mentioned before with the attenuation on the links. So, but let's just start and configure ZR. Um, Arista has a pretty neat um, solution for ZR. I mean, ZR itself is a standard, right? 
um, but we have an, an amp and a booster in a transceiver form factor, which you can just plug into your switch, and pretty much a splitter cable, which offers you eight times up to eight times 400 gig um, for that particular amp. This is the setup we're pretty much used. So on the top left side, you could see the output of a switch. We had two ZR optics in there. Um, we had the amp plugged in there. Um, the amp, we only get uh, digital um, transceiver details and the um, uh, ZR optics are detected as regular 400 gig optics. How you configure them? This is, it's super easy. It's pretty much configuring a normal 100 gig or 10 gig or whatever transceiver. Besides the point, you need to specify the frequency in the 100 gigahertz or 75 gigahertz grid. So those links are running obviously side to side, point to point links. Um, so we were establishing like 800 gig between two sides over two links. Um, and you can see we were running them on different frequencies. To validate the link afterwards and what the transceiver is actually seeing, it is very important that you look at the post-fac error ratio. Um, that has to be zero, otherwise um, you really get in trouble with your link. With the chromatic dispersion, this is actually something which you can use to calculate your actual link length. So in, um, we know that the fiber we're having has an average of 17 um, picoseconds per nanometer. So we could um, accommodate for that and say, OK, the link has roughly about 39 kilometers of length. And then you see that the laser is configured to 193,100 gigahertz. Um, one thing I want to point out is there is also a sensor for the case temperature. This, uh, this, this um, QSFP in the, uh, DD in this case runs pretty hot. So it runs at 66 degrees, not something you want your engineer to touch. The line system I mentioned earlier on is a pretty cool way of, well, looking how much gain you have um, on the, um, well, from the transceiver side. Because you always have a booster, which is the egress to the link, and the preamp, which is the incoming. Um, I mentioned before that the, uh, the ZR optics have a pretty low launch power, so that's why you always need a boost as well. And the, uh, this, this particular splitter cable um, eats up a lot of attenuation. I'm going to show, uh, show you this later on as well. So we're seeing here the uh, TX, what comes, uh, sorry, the RX, which comes in from the optic, is minus 17 dB on the booster, and it goes out with plus 9. So there is a significant boost there. This is pretty much the same, but now on, an, on the 80 kilometer link. So you see the uh, post fac ratio is still zero, but the link is way longer. We're talking about 81.2 kilometers here, um, and we're running on the same laser frequency as before. I'm gonna briefly skip over here. So same details here, but apparently my colleague did not clean the fiber very well because we had higher attenuation on one side. So this is also something we can obtain um, if we're using an integrated amp boost transceiver. It's important to actually get those alerts, as you might know them from your actually, uh, actual DWDM systems. In terms of um, forward error correction, we're talking about two modes here. We have CFAC and OFAC, and they both been, have, have different sensible values for what they can use for, like the loss margin. Um, CFAC, we're talking around 100 kilometers um, at 0 0.25 dB, which should be the standard for a regular single mode fiber, or 30 dBs for 120 kilometers. OFAC is more like the standard already for ZR+. In our case, the fiber was not really good. Um, 
So we were pretty close to the 30 dB loss margin. So it's, it's always around 30 dB, right? It might work at also at like 32, but yeah, this, this was a pretty close call, I think. So we could see that we actually had a loss in our fiber of 0 0.37 uh, dB per kilometer and already had to use OFAC instead of CFAC. What's the summary then about ZR? I mean, ZR overall is built as a point-to-point -point solution. It's built as a, you could call it a data center interconnect metro, metro kind of um, solution. You usually doesn't, uh, don't need any um, rodems or, or inline amps or anything like that because you're still in a metro kind of style solution. Um, the preamp and, and booster would be available in, in a transceiver form factor, which makes it also a very easy to manage plug and play solution. ZR can also work with external line systems, so it might actually work with a brownfield deployment you already have, but you need to validate it particularly with the uh, filters your DWDM system operates on. That's it uh, for ZR, now probably setting the stage a bit for ZR Plus as we're talking long haul. So ZR Plus, um, there's actually a um, multi-source agreement called Open ZR Plus, which became an open industry standard nowadays. So in the past you had 400 gig ZR and you had Open Rotom. Um, they pretty much went then into um, ZR Plus. And ZR Plus is pretty much four times 100 gig multiplexing. And yeah, uh, one of the interesting things, particularly around ZR Plus, are the application modes. And this looks like probably a bit um, overwhelming. This comes from a um, um, from Smart Optics, actually from a data sheet from their optic. Um, what are those application modes? You can operate those transceivers in different modes depending on your link characteristics. That means you have the host side, which is the optical side, and you have the electrical interface, which is the representation to your switch. Later on, you will also see we're, we're operating one link on a very odd mode, which is a 3 times 100 gig electrical and a 3 times 100 gig optical but it is really represented as three different interfaces on the switch itself. For the link characteristics, um, there you pretty much define what kind of application mode you're running on, depending on what kind of TX power you have, what kind of OSNR you have, or, uh, what kind of uh, chromatic dispersation you have. Um, so there are a lot of different values which you need to take into account when you really want to run long-haul links. The cool thing about um, ZR Plus, as I said, is really built for long-haul. We're talking here, we have, it says 300 to, to 3,000 kilometers. The theoretical range varies a lot. Um, Next, one of the next slides will actually say, depending on kind of what type of amplification you have, you could reach up to 5,000 kilometers. Um, but the, the important stuff for the third-party line systems you might operate today already is the optics have very low launch power. This is because of power constraints um, you have in the current uh, transceiver form factors as well and the heat. I mean, you already saw how hot uh, a regular ZR optic gets. Um, imagine what a, a ZR Plus does. So if you have a brownfield deployment, you might need actually a preamp before uh, between your optic and your WDM line system. Reach with ZR Plus is actually achieved by line side speed and modulation and kind of the type of uh, amplifiers you have. So you see you're getting less range if you just use an ADVA uh, amplifier, but you're getting more range if you use ADVA and Raman amplifiers. And then you're gonna drill down, well you start with like 400 kilometers, to be honest like a thousand kilometer range is pretty good in my sense and in, in speaking for myself, I mean, 
coming out of Germany, this gets you from north to south. Um, if you want to then drill down or, or run it over subsea cables or something like this, um, you might have to use less line speed and different modulations. But this again then comes down also to the, uh, to the application modes your optic supports. So the setup we were running was a brownfield deployment in an existing carrier network on, on actual fiber for Zetter Plus. Um, we had a Nokia DWDM system, we had Arista switches there. Um, the Zetter optics being used were from smart optics, um, the same the data sheet I shared on earlier. Um, but they're really like OEM from Acacia. We were running two different links uh, from the same switch. So yeah, it's a, it's a bit schematic, um, but one was running uh, about 40 kilometers and the other one was on a 750 kilometer link. So also quite significant. About the configuration, um, it was it's pretty much the same, sorry, um, pretty much the same as with uh, ZR. So you configure your frequency, but then you also configure the application mode you want to run the optic on. In our case, this was for the 40 kilometer link. The link characteristics were okay for application mode five. So it presents one times 400 gig, eight lanes on the optical side, and um, uh, four times, uh, sorry, uh, one, um, one times 400 gig, four lanes on the, uh, on the optical side, and one times 400 gig, eight lanes on the transceiver side, on the host side. Um, one thing to mention here, and this is probably a bit Arista specific, might apply to other vendors as well. Keep in mind the power budget your switch has available for each port. We're not talking like those three watt optics anymore we had in the past. We're talking about if you put every single optic in a, in a switch or a router, the optics might eat up more power than everything else on the system. This optic here in this case wanted to draw 23.75 watts. The switch was certified for 20 watts, so we actually had to do a safety override. This is something you should always check with your vendor before, as this can damage the switch. Looking at the link, um, so one thing to mention here is compared, well, I didn't, didn't show you that earlier. <laughs> um, if you look at the transceiver DOM values, you have an RX total power and an RX channel power. Um, that means the total power is the overall signal the optic receives. The channel power is what it needs for this particular frequency. Just think of tuning like a satellite TV or anything like that. You get a broad signal, but you actually just want to nail it down to one particular channel. Um, with the previous solution, with the splitter cable, you see actually way more total power than channel power you're actually using because the splitter cable is passive, you just receive everything and let the transceiver sort out what it actually needs. Uh, here we're already getting the right channel from the active DWDM system. We have the chromatic dispersion as well. Um, important, the received OSNR estimate is also shown here. This is not something we had in the ZR optic. And well, overall the link came up. We see it's operational at one times 400 gig. And as error correction, we have Raid Solomon uh, with a lane count of eight links towards the host. So it's represented as a single interface, um, as you might know it from, uh, from uh, 100 gig or so, no breakouts. So for the 400 gig and uh, for, the, for the 750 kilometers, it looks actually quite different. So what we need to do here is we go to the master port and set the speed to 100 gig dash two. What that means is 100 gig wave in 250 gig lanes. Um, then we also tell it to use application mode seven. As we see on the bottom, um, this is actually a 300 gig mode. Sounds a bit odd, um, but it is as it is. Um, so it's representing 300 gig on the optical side, but three times 100 gig on the electrical side. 
which ends up in three different lanes being used, like as in a breakout scenario. Um, this is also what's configured then here on, um, on the left side too, and we tell it what kind of lanes um, it should use with the override command. And this is actually how it's then represented in the system. And it's, if you want to, you can still use that for, for whatever reasons, um, but it's not like multiplexed by the switch itself. It is literally three different 100 gig links. So you need to take care of the load sharing yourself, uh, use ECMP or any other technology. So this is uh, just a very important uh, detail to know that if you want to use a sub mode, which could also be something like here, um, if you look at application mode nine, would still be 400 gig on the um, on the uh, line side, but four times 100 gig on the electrical side would represent you with four times 100 gig instead of three. Uh, so this is something very important to just keep an eye on and might actually change from use case to use case. You could also use a switch as a patch panel terminator for optical connections and then just bridge everything through. Um, then probably the four times 100 gig makes more sense than a 400 gig port. To sum it briefly up for ZR Plus, so ZR Plus we're talking pretty much everything about 120 kilometers. Right now, the only optics available are uh, low optical output powers, so also low launch power below 10 dB. And they are not really comfortable, um, um, compatible per se with brownfield um, line systems because you need this preamp. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. It's also not compatible with every switch platform you have out there now, um, as of today. This is usually be uh, yeah, because of the, the power constraints and thermal constraints I've, I've shown you earlier. Transceiver qualities are varying a lot. We're talking about transceivers needing between 18 watts and 25 watts depending on the on the supplier so there is this is this is very very inconsistent so check them before you deploy them um, and well severe word of warning using those transceivers in in unsupported platforms can irreversibly damage your device because they're just running too hot for Setup Plus with over zero dB launch power, they're yet to come, I think, later this year. Um, they have even higher power consumption, but they would be available, uh, they would be compatible with existing line systems. So check before, talk to your vendors, talk to your optics vendors, and um, well, see what kind of, of power constraints and thermal constraints they have. In the end, it is still a solution which you need to validate with your optical and, and switch vendors so to see if they interrupt properly. There are, there's obviously not really a lot of experience out there as well, and it took us also quite some time with that customer to get everything up and running properly. And um, well, that's it from me. Any questions? No. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you.